رأينا نفعا لجيشنا أن نجري بعضا من الإجراءات الضرورية في مناصب الجيش The voice of Hussein bin Talal, the third king of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. A controversial figure, never far from a political crisis. He came to power in a succession crisis after his grandfather's assassination. من أصعب المواقف اللي جابتها هي وقوفي إلى جانب الجد المؤسس على بوابة المسجد الأقصى. He joined Egypt and Syria in the 1967 war against Israel. أيها الرجال في أرض المعركة. اقتلوهم حيث وجدتموهم بأسلحتكم بأسنانكم إخوانكم في العروبة معكم في هذه المعركة البطولية التاريخية He walked a tightrope between the Arab world, Israel, the Palestinians, and the West. أقسم بالله أن أحافظ على الدستور وأن أخلص للأمة cynical opportunist maneuvering to stay in power, or a major political figure whose legacy is still felt in the Middle East today. This is the story of King Hussein of Jordan. The 20th of July 1951 was a critical day in the history of Jordan. King Abdullah bin al Hussein, the founder of the kingdom, was attending Friday prayers at Al Aqsa Mosque in eastern Jerusalem when he was confronted by a young Palestinian man. Abdullah was shot dead at the gate of the mosque. He had paid the ultimate price for what Palestinians saw as his too close relationship with the new state of Israel. Jordan had annexed the West Bank and Jerusalem, along with its Palestinian population, in the 1948 war that they call Al Nakba, the catastrophe. Abdullah's death would determine the life and career of his grandson, the teenage Prince Hussein. كان لدى الفلسطينيين خلفية واضحة عن دور النظام الأردني أو دور العائلة الهاشمية بالتحديد في شرقية الأردن في دعم الحركة الصهيونية وكان الأمير عبد الله يقيم علاقات جيدة مع الحركة الصهيونية في فلسطين والعديد من زعماء الحركة الصهيونية زاروا الأردن بما فيهم جولدا مائير ولهذا ليس غريبا أن يكون هناك تعبئة ذهنية وتربوية ونفسية ضد الملك وأن هذه التعبئة في النهاية ستنتج أشخاص يمكن أن يقوم بعملية الاغتيال نعم King Abdullah was murdered in front of his 15-year-old grandson Prince Hussein bin Talal Hussein had had a very special relationship with his grandfather The death of the king had a profound effect on him both at the time and throughout his life and career. It brought home how serious the threat to the crown could be and the gravity of his responsibilities as king in the years to come. من أصعب المواقف اللي جابتها في بدايات هذه الرحلة هي وقوفي إلى جانب الجد المؤسس على بوابة المسجد الأقصى المبارك تلك اللحظات اللي تغير فيها كل شيء بالنسبة لي 
The assassination created huge uncertainty in Jordan and triggered a succession crisis. It was unclear who should succeed King Abdullah. Under the constitution, his eldest son, Crown Prince Talal, was next in line. But things weren't quite that simple. Talal was in Switzerland, undergoing medical treatment. Reports and rumors circulating at the time, in royal circles and in the press, said that Prince Talal was suffering from mental illness. King Abdullah had signed the Anglo-Jordanian Treaty with Britain in 1948, and some reports said that Crown Prince Talal was hostile to Britain and its interventions in Jordan. They said this had caused a major dispute between father and son. There were also those who favored the king's second son, Nayef ibn Abdullah, as successor. The intrigue thickened and drew in the British and the other branch of the Hashemite family ruling in Iraq. يعني نائبا للملك أم يجب الانتظار حتى يأتي ولي العهد ويعين ملكا وهل صحة ولي العهد تسمح له بذلك أم لا يعني في بداية الأمر تقرر إرسال وفد طبي للذهاب للتأكد من أن ولي العهد صحيا يستطيع القدوم إلى عمان والمنادى به ملكا على البلاد وذهب الوفد الطبي وعاد في نهاية الأمر تقرر لأنه صار في ضغوط أيضا من الجانب العراقي لتعيين الأمير نايف اعتقادا منهم أنه في نهاية الأمر يمكن أن يتولى عرش الأردن أحد أفراد العائلة المالكة الهاشمية في العراق هناك كمان حقائق ابرزها بعض الباحثين تدل ان الملك عبد الله كان رايه ادماج الاردن في العراق الهاشمي فكتب وصيه في اخر حياته يقول فيها بانتقال الملك الى اكثر عضو في العائله الهاشميه صلاحيه مما يعني طبعا ملك العراق انذاك فيصل الثاني بسبب حجم العراق وامكانيات العراق والى اخره وطبعا حاول العراقيين العراقيون بعد اغتيال إحياء هذه الوصية والترتيب لوحده وعرض ذلك الإنجليز ورئيس الوزراء أنذاك توفيق أبو الهدى The decision was that Prince Nayef should act as interim regent of Jordan. He assumed the role on the 20th of July 1951 and ruled in his older brother's place for seven weeks until Talal was deemed fit to take the throne on the 6th of September. The principal British military figure in Jordan for over a decade had been Sir John Baggett Glubb, known locally as Glubb Pasha. He commanded and trained the Jordanian army and, along with other leading politicians, was opposed to the regent Nayef. Glubb now played a key role in the succession crisis. He and Prime Minister Tawfiq Abul Huda decided to bring Prince Talal back from Switzerland to succeed his father. But this was part of a longer-term plan to cultivate the young Prince Hussein. They saw potential in him, as well as some of his grandfather's qualities. But as he was too young to become king, Glubb and his supporters wanted to put his father Talal on the throne until the time was right for Hussein. Another key player in the intrigue was Hussein's mother, Queen Zain al-Sharaf. Zain was the most prominent woman in the Hashemite royal family. She had a strong personality and spoke four languages. 
she would support Hussein throughout his long and difficult career, but now used all her influence to implement club's Machiavellian plan to put Talal on the throne. Needless to say, when Prince Nayef and his men discovered Glob's plan, they began to plot their own route to the crown. بالطبع الدول الإقليمية كان لها دور أيضا في الموضوع فالمملكة العربية السعودية أيدت أن أن يبقى العرش في البيت الهاشمي الأردني وبريطانيا أيضا وهذا كان ثقل كبير بالنسبة للمنطقة والمعارضة الوحيدة اللي كانت أو الطمع الوحيد اللي كان في العرش الأردني هو من العراق. But Prince Nayef's plan failed and left the way open for Talal to succeed his father as king. On the 6th of September 1951, Talal arrived in Amman and went immediately to parliament to be sworn in as the new king of Jordan. Hussein became crown prince and then left for Britain to resume his education at the private and privileged Harrow School. But Talal's rule was brief. His health deteriorated, and a year into his reign, the Jordanian Council of Ministers appointed a committee to assume the authority of the ailing king. مرض مرة ثانية وشكلت لجنة من الأطباء وذهب للعلاج وبعد أن ذهب للعلاج زاد المرض عليه مرض يعني نفسي وعصبي جاء بتقارير طبية تثبت عجز الملك عن مواصلة عمله كرئيس للدولة وبناء على هذه التقارير قرر مجلس الأمة بمجلس النواب ومجلس العيان قرروا إنهاء يعني عمل الملك والمنادى طبعا بولي العهد الأمير حسين بن طلال ملكا على البلاد In August 1952, Prince Hussein was on holiday in Geneva with his mother and family when an envelope arrived from the Jordanian Prime Minister addressed to His Majesty King Hussein. It described what had happened in Amman. His father, Talal, had abdicated and Hussein was now to become king. Prime Minister Tawfiq Abu Huda had informed the National Assembly that King Talal was no longer able to exercise power. He presented reports on his health signed by five doctors, three Jordanian and two from abroad. Under the Jordanian constitution, if the king was incapacitated by mental illness, the National Assembly could depose him and transfer power to the crown prince. Hussein arrived in Amman to a reception of mixed feelings among the Jordanian people. They were still recovering from the assassination of King Abdullah when Talal was deposed after less than a year. Now, they were presented with a 17-year-old as his successor. The constitution stipulated that Hussein couldn't take the throne until he was 18 by the Muslim calendar. So a regency council was formed of the prime minister, 
members of the House of Representatives, and senior senators, to perform the functions of the monarch. In the meantime, Hussein returned to Britain to spend six intensive months at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. On the 2nd of May, 1953, Hussein reached his 18th birthday by the Muslim calendar. He processed through the streets of Amman to cheering crowds and made his way to Parliament to take the oath of office. Hussein was crowned the third king of Jordan. On the same day, his cousin was crowned Faisal II of the other country under strong British influence in the region, Iraq. Hussein became king at a time of uncertainty and instability in the region. He faced three main challenges. First, the British. King Abdullah had agreed the Anglo-Jordanian Treaty with them in 1948, allowing them to maintain military bases there. Their presence was a dominant one. Second, Israel and the Palestinians. Four years after the founding of Israel and Jordan's annexation of the West Bank and its Palestinian population, Hussein had to deal with this enormous issue. Thirdly, Gamal Abdel Nasser had overthrown the Egyptian king, putting the future of monarchies in the Arab world into question and influencing Hussein's future relationship with Nasser. Hussein surrounded himself with a small circle. His mother, Queen Zain, his uncle Sharif Nasser bin Jamil from Hashemite, Iraq. His cousin, and lifelong friend, Zaid ibn Shakir, and a core group of men who'd been loyal to King Abdullah, mainly from inside the army. In the first time, the Hussein was on the political leaders who were in the army. For example, Abu al-Huda, Samir al-Rifai, and Ibrahim Hashim. A year after Hussein became king, in October 1953, the vulnerability of the West Bank became crystal clear. Israeli troops, led by Ariel Sharon, overran the village of Qibya. It was a glimpse of the future. Israel claimed there were Palestinian infiltrators in the village who'd carried out operations inside Israel. But at least 69 civilians were killed, including women and children. The <laughs> يقوم بملاحقة الفلسطينيين سواء كانوا مقاومين أو كانوا مهربين، فكان يبدو الجهد كبير جدا، وطبعا نعي هذا الوقت هذا الوضع ونحن صغار، ونحن لسه يعني ننظر إلى الحرس الوطني وكأنه جيش عربي. بعدين طبعا لما كبرنا وأصبح لدينا وعي أصبحنا نكتشف لا إنه النظام لم يكن يقوم بحماية الفلسطينيين. طريقة رسم الحدود 
أدت لكثير من عدم الاستقرار لأن الحدود رسمت بشكل أنه قرى والسكان بقيوا مع الأردن بينما أراضيهم تحت السيطرة الإسرائيلية فكان يحاول الأهالي وأصحاب هذه الأراضي التسلل إليها بقطف ثمارها أو زراعتها بأي طريقة وكان يجابوهم الإسرائيليين ببطش شديد The attack on Qibya was a key moment in Hussein's relationship with the Palestinians, who felt the Jordanian army did nothing to stop the Israelis. It asked questions of Jordan's presence and role in the West Bank, and provoked protests across the country, as Palestinians accused the Jordanian army of failing to protect their people. The young king was faced by mass social unrest, and forced to confront the most complex problem the Middle East has ever faced, and one which remains today, Palestinian refugees. But Palestinian anger was not only directed at Jordan. Britain was also their target, and Sir John Bagot Glubb in particular. He commanded the Jordanian army, and the Palestinians accused Glubb Pasha of complicity in the Qibya attack and a failure to defend the people of the village. تبين موجودات الجيش من الذخيرة شيء هزيل والله العظيم مكتوبات بخط اليد بثلاث أربع أوراقات على خط الفشي زمان أول أقسم لك بالله ما في غيره والثاني الخطة الاستراتيجية التي تقضي بانسحاب القوات الأردنية من الضفة الغربية بكاملها إلى المرتفعات الشرقية هاي الوقفين هون عند أول اشتباك جدي مع اليهود وديت اللي جاي السيدنا كان مازن مرافق وشافا فعل فعالا شديدا Glob Pasha effectively ran the Jordanian army, so Hussein's relationship with him was crucial, but difficult. Glob was much older, but there was more. Hussein knew that he and his country would never be truly independent as long as the British remained in Jordan. Coming up, how Hussein would address this strange relationship and end 40 years of British military involvement in Jordan.